The Iowa City Foreign Relations Council hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since the number one pop song was Every Breath You Take by the Police in 1983. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's Internationals Program, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special sponsors, Heidi Gaylor, Karen and Wallace Chapel, and David and Diane Martin. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4, or 118-2, and the U of I Library's Digital Archives. Over 220 ICFRC pro, uh, podcasts can now be found on iTunes as well. Um, at this time, though, it is my pleasure to introduce Brahm Elias and Stella Elias. Professor Brahm Elias is a clinical associate professor at the University of Iowa's College of Law and has directed the clinic's immigration practice since 2015. Previously, he worked as a private immigration attorney in Iowa City, where his work focused on federal immigration law, removal defense, and several other immigration-focused issues. Professor Stella Bergelias joined the Iowa Law Faculty in 2012 after a two-year appointment at, as a uh, Clemenco Fellow and Lecturer on Law at Harvard Law School. She teaches civil procedure, foundations of international law, immigration law, and comparative law, and directs the Iowa's London Law Program. Her research involves public international and comparative law with a focus on the United States and foreign immigration and nationality laws. Um, I've also worked with them both personally on community ID as well as other things, and I have thoroughly appreciated the help they have provided me both professionally and as a person. So um, at, please join me, though, at this time in welcoming Brahm Elias and Stella Elias. Thank you very much, Janet, for that kind introduction. Um, and happy Valentine's Day, everyone. <laughs> we are um, obviously a binational British and American married couple, and we spend our time teaching here in the US and in the UK, running Iowa's London Law Program. Uh, and so in honor of Valentine's Day and the long-standing special relationship between our two great nations, we decided when we were asked to do an update on immigration issues that we would address immigration lawmaking in the era of Trump and Brexit. Because it turns out immigration law and policy is a mess on both sides <laughs> of the Atlantic. Uh, so we are entering the third year of the Trump administration here in the United States. And with it, uh, three years of increased salience for immigration issues in American politics. And as we speak, the clock is ticking on Brexit in the UK, uh, with the UK's withdrawal from the EU currently scheduled for March 29th. Although we've silenced our phones, so we can't check right now to see if that's still true. Um, could change any minute. Uh, but one of the things we're going to talk about today is the incredibly salient role immigration played in British politics, specifically with Brexit issues. Uh, in fact, in both countries, immigration was the single most salient issue when voters went to the polls. Uh, in the United Kingdom, a YouGov poll taken just before the June 23rd, 2016 Brexit referendum found that 56% of Britons, irrespective of political party affiliation, thought that immigration and asylum was the most important issue issue facing the country. Uh, here in the United States, in the presidential election in 2016, uh, Gallup found that among Republican or Republican-leaning voters, 77 percent thought that immigration was the single most important issue in the last presidential election. Um, among Democratic or Democratic-leaning voters, immigration was ranked number one by 65 percent. Um, so it had become the number one topic. Those numbers dropped a little for the midterm elections, but were still the centerpiece of the coordinated Republican campaign nationwide, keeping immigration quite salient. And in both countries, voters' attitudes to immigration were altered and shaped by, or rather reshaped, in extraordinary ways during the political campaigns. Um, so this is where we start with your charming and appetizing graphic uh, that we have passed out. Um, in case you wanted to know, uh, how long it would take before folks got into Nazi comparisons. We are breaking the land speed right record away. in the first five minutes of speech. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but just as as a way of um, of demonstrating how salient these things were and how similar the dynamics were in the U.S. Uh, and the U.K., the top graphic on your page was from a TV commercial, uh, a TV spot, and an internet spot that was per produced and then time paid for by the uh, re-elect Donald Trump 2020 campaign. Uh, so there was this, the presidential re-elect campaign ran a commercial uh, a few days before the midterm elections. It was aired on NBC television during Sunday night football, the Sunday night before the Tuesday election, and also on Facebook. By the end of the night, concerns that the ad itself was, um, was racist led uh, CNN and Fox News to refuse to run the ad on their own channels, and NBC and Facebook pulled it. But before it was pulled, uh, the ad had this image. It, the ad started with uh, a short video of uh, a person who had been convicted of murder, of murdering a police officer, and the, the defendant in the case was an undocumented immigrant, and it cut from, his, from an interview with him to a picture of the so-called caravan of refugees and migrants, aspiring refugees and migrants moving up through Central America with this tagline, who else would Democrats let in? Um, this was the image of folks moving up through Central America and Mexico to come to the southern border of the United States. And this move was right out of exactly the same playbook used by the Leave campaign during the run-up to the Brexit referendum. The far-right UK Independence Party produced the second image here, which is a, which is a poster bearing the slogan, breaking point, the EU has failed us all. And it shows um, a photo that was genuinely taken by a, by a photographer at the Slovenia-Croatia border in 2015 after Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, announced that um, refugee and asylum seekers would be welcome in Germany during that period. And so this picture was taken at the border and then photoshopped to take out the women to, make, to ensure that the photo shows um, just uh, non-white, predominantly Muslim migrants crossing the border. And it was pointed out at the time that the photo was produced, it bears an eerie resemblance to your bottom picture, which is a still from a Nazi documentary um, that was produced, um, the, the, a Nazi, a Nazi propaganda film, uh, the still of which was reproduced in a BBC documentary called The Road to Auschwitz, showing the way that in the late 1930s, the Nazis portrayed Jews and other refugees and resettled people in the interwar period. There were also statements in both the American political environment and the British political environment um, racially mischaracterizing the immigrant groups that were arriving. So one of the things that, um, that President Trump said about the caravan of migrants coming through Mexico, which was almost exclusively folks coming from, uh, from Central America, particularly the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, El Salvador, uh, and Guatemala, um, President Trump, without any evidence to support this, had said that there were Islamic extremist terrorists who had infiltrated the caravan and were marching up through Mexico um, to enter the United States. Similarly, in, in the UK, do you want to talk about the Turkish numbers? In, in the UK, uh, there was a lot of talk right around the same time this ad was coming out that one of the reasons it was important for the UK to pull out of the EU was the possibility that 80 million Turks were about to have complete and total access to, uh, to the UK without any border control. The, the theory this is the, yeah. this, this is hilarious because first of all, Turkey is a nation of seventy-seven million people, so there aren't eighty million <laughs> Turks anywhere in the world. Um, and secondly, Turkey is not a member of the EU. Turkey has been seeking to accede to the EU for over twenty years with absolutely no success because there are set criteria for EU membership for serious consideration of EU membership that Turkey has not met, and for a variety of 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 economic, political, and social reasons will not meet. Uh, and so this paper tiger, this, this you know, elephant in the room of what if Turkey joins the EU was treated as a credible and real threat by these campaigners. Basically, in both countries, these campaigns essentially created similar versions of an otherized threat. Predominantly, people of color um, with an emphasis on terrorism and Islam. Um, this is part of a phenomenon that all of you are aware of called post-truth politics. But now, one, two, three years later, after the post-truth political campaigning, we are seeing a new phenomenon of post-truth policies. 
where these two nations with this long history of welcoming and embracing diversity and inclusion and assimilating and integrating and welcoming immigrant communities are embracing not just the rhetoric, but the policy of exclusion. So in both countries, beyond the, the public discourse about immigrant communities, this has had an effect on laws and policies affecting settled immigrants who've lived in the US and the UK for many years, new immigrants who are arriving at the border, refugees and asylum seekers, and relevant for our community, international students. So we thought we would talk uh, uh, briefly about each of these categories of folks to give you an update on what's happening in both countries. And in each of these categories, we've got a series of examples of places where we're dealing with a sort of post-truth policy phenomenon where, where policies are being enacted to uh, explicitly to satisfy what is called the political demand from the previous political campaigns even when it was quite clear at the time that those political demands weren't tied to truths on the ground. So there are now policies being created to match the articulated truth, which is very difficult for policymakers who are dealing with facts on the ground as their policies are implemented. Any one of these policies that we're going to talk about, any one of the individual examples in the four categories we want to talk about, we could stand up here for half an hour and talk about at length. So these will necessarily be quick and overview um, summative information. But if you want to know more, ask us questions or come talk to us afterwards. We'd love to talk about these in detail. OK, so we wanted to start with the topic of um, the way these new policies are affecting settled immigrants who have been either in the US or the UK for a long period of time here before this new change in politics and how the changes in policy are affecting them. Some examples in the United States. Uh, we've talked, actually, I talked here about a year ago about um, the new public charge rule that's being considered in the United States. This is uh, a rule that would, um, it's a proposed, nothing has gone through yet, but a Trump administration proposal to make it more difficult for immigrants who have lived in the United States and do not yet have green card status, permanent resident status, but would like to acquire a green card, permanent resident status, that at the point of that application, um, the change in policy would say that someone who has received public benefits lawfully, things like food stamps, Medicaid, things like that, that if they have received those benefits that will make it more difficult or in some cases impossible for that person to get a green card in the future. Now, in fact, it's first of all, the policy change is merely proposed. It hasn't gone through yet. It was proposed in October. There were two months for notice and comment. Over 200,000 public comments came into the federal administrative system. And the policy is on hold while the federal government determines whether any of those comments change the policy. If it is ever actually put into effect by the federal administration, it will almost certainly be the subject of legal challenges. There is no likelihood that this new policy will go into effect anytime soon. Also, the policy is limited to people who are in the United States, do not yet have green cards, but will seek them. So it right. does not really affect people who are not in the United States. It certainly doesn't affect people in the United States who have green cards, who would like to naturalize as US citizens. Nonetheless, the rumor that there might be an effect from receiving lawful benefits that will make it more difficult uh, to, to adjust your immigration status has led lots of folks of various immigration statuses, including naturalized US citizens, to think maybe it's not safe to receive the public benefits they're entitled to. So we've seen ticks down in uh, immigrants or folks of various immigration statuses receiving Medicaid, uh, receiving free and reduced lunch at schools that they're entitled to, just decreased uptake of lawful benefits because of concern about this change in policy. Uh, there's been a new denaturalization task force. Um, denaturalization is the process by which someone who was not a US citizen then became a US citizen, can be stripped of their United States citizenship. It is phenomenally rare. Uh, from 2005 to 2016, it happened about 16 times a year. The only ground for denaturalization is if you committed fraud in the process of naturalizing. It's not you've done something once you're a citizen and you lose, lose your citizenship. Um, it's extremely uncommon and procedurally very difficult. It requires going to a federal court with a prosecutor involved. Um, the independent judiciary has a chance to decide whether to denaturalize someone or not. It's why it's so uncommon. But last June, the Trump administration uh, proposed a denaturalization task force in Los Angeles that was going to, it said, hire dozens of attorneys and immigration officials. It didn't mention the breakdown of those two, and many people think the breakdown is actually zero attorneys mm -hmm. and 16 paralegals from, uh, from the immigration system. No one knows. Uh, and that group has started reviewing people who have naturalized as citizens to see if they could be denaturalized. 
it's extremely unlikely to actually affect anyone. So far, 2,500 cases have been reviewed. Of those 2,500, only 100 have been referred for further investigation uh, to federal prosecutors, which are the folks who would ultimately decide whether to come forward with these cases. There has been no uptick in actual cases brought. But the thought that becoming a citizen will not protect you from subsequent immigration enforcement has led to a reduction in the number of people who are seeking to naturalize which is an expensive process, and if you can make it look like it's, there's less of a light at the end of the tunnel, fewer people enter the tunnel. So public charge, denaturalization, uh, there's been an increase in immigration raids in the interior. We had one, it'll be, uh, the one year anniversary will be in May of a raid in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, that was in May of last year. That will also be the 11 year anniversary of the largest immigration raid in American history in Postville, Iowa, 11 years ago. Just yesterday in my hometown of San Diego, California, there was a raid at a Korean grocery store um, that picked up about 26 folks and put them in immigration proceedings. There's been an uptick in those uh, in, during the Trump administration compared to the, the late Obama administration. Um, and then there's also been, uh, this is a little harder to quantify, but I think this will be resonant for most of the folks in the room, an uptick in the rhetorical conflation of immigration with criminality. Um, in Iowa, of course, we have Steve King, our congressman in the northwest corner, um, who talked about folks coming over the border with calves the size of cantaloupes from uh, hauling drugs, suggesting he knows very little about immigration or at least cantaloupe-based agriculture. Um, <laughs> the president has talked about uh, how important it is to prevent immigration because of criminality. He actually, just yesterday, the, um, the re-elect campaign started selling a bumper sticker that says, build the wall and crime will fall. It rhymes better than it jives with statistics. Uh, mm -hmm. Statistically, um, a, a report from the Cato Institute that came out last year suggests that undocumented immigrants tend to commit crimes, all crimes, violent and nonviolent in the United States, at about half the rate of um, folks who were born in the United States. Documented immigrants commit crimes at about the rate of one-seventh that of um, people who were born in the United States. That's totally rational when you think about it because the penalty that immigrants suffer for committing crimes, which is not just the criminal justice penalty, but then the possibility of deportation, is much steeper than the penalty suffered by native-born citizens who cannot be removed afterwards. Um, so it's not crazy to think of it, but the facts are quite clear that immigrants commit crimes at much lower rates. That hasn't changed the rhetorical uh, posture of the administration. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, Brexit has not happened yet, so new rules have not gone into effect. But several white papers have been issued and, um, and legislation has been passed in the event that Brexit goes into effect, specifying how the immigration rules will be changed. And the largest change, of course, is that millions of EU citizens currently resident in the UK will automatically lose their right to live and work there. So they have to, they've, they've been informed they need to re-register for something called settled status. To achieve settled status, you have to demonstrate that you have lived in the United Kingdom for over five years. You have to go through financial and criminal background checks. Uh, you initially had to pay a, six, a fee of £65 to even submit an application for consideration. After public outcry, that fee was withdrawn. Um, and you had to demonstrate your skill level if you had resided in the UK for less than five years and your income. And so all individuals who earned less than £30,000 a year year, the current exchange rate, that's around $45,000, um, automatically lose their residency within the UK and are only entitled to remain for up to 12 months. That Mm -hmm. is um, that mirrors, uh, the discussion around this mirrors the discussion around the, the new, pu the proposed changes to the public charge doctrine. Again, there has been no change to the law, but people fear what the change to the rules will mean. People are not claiming the welfare benefits to which they're entitled. Their children are losing their free and reduced school lunches as families make the decision that they need to somehow demonstrate that they are financially self-sufficient, even if this hasn't been part of their calculus for many years and the conflation of immigrants with criminality and terrorism in the popular media, especially local media, is on the rise. You want to talk about new immigrants at the border? Um, 
So that's the cheerful thing that's happening within the country. <laughs> um, at the border, as part of the white paper announcing the new immigration rules, um, the, the Tory government, as part of their campaign platform in the last election, said that they would reduce net migration uh, to the U UK from its current level of about 273,000 to under 100,000 each year. And they would change the composition of migrants, this should all sound quite familiar, from, um, from a mixture of skilled and unskilled workers to primarily skilled workers. So to, in order to qualify for a tier two visa, the equivalent of, of here an employment-based visa, uh, you would need to demonstrate that you have a bachelor's degree at the least and preferably a master's degree and you're coming to take a position uh, that will pay you more than £30,000 a year. Moreover, if you're an individual who is an unskilled worker, in other words, if you lack a professional background and you're coming from a high-risk country, you will not be issued a tourist visa because of the fear that you will overstay. Uh, unskilled workers from low-risk countries, like the United States, will still be able to enter through the visa waiver program or obtain a tourist visa. Um, but there are new standards, very similar to the standards announced when President Trump said he was going to do deep vetting of incomers. Uh, the new immigration rules also include criminal background checks and financial background checks to be applied to all immigrants. This is a tremendous concern, as nobody knows what this will, ha what this will do to, to processing at the border. For those of you who've been to the United Kingdom, you know what it's like to arrive at Heathrow Airport or Gatwick Airport, Airport and go through security. But it's not the airport borders that everyone is most concerned about. It's the border between Ulster and the Republic of Ireland. Because as of yet, there is no agreement on how to handle the border between Northern Ireland, a part of the United Kingdom, and the Republic of Ireland, which is not. And every day, people cross that border in the routine course of their business, and there is no legislative or regulatory scheme, as of now, designed to control that border. And so no one knows how these new rules will be implemented. And so I, but I went to graduate school in Belfast in Northern Ireland, and one of the issues with the Irish border, there's you know, demilitarizing and removing the Irish border was a, was a big part of the peace process in Northern Ireland and the Troubles. Um, one reason that it was so important was the political question of the relationship between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. But another reason that doesn't get understood quite as well over here, or even in the rest of the UK other than Northern Ireland, was the existence of a hard border and a customs requirement to cross that hard border in Ireland was the primary funding source for almost all paramilitary activity in Northern Ireland because it was arbitrage and running um, materials Smuggling. across the border that was the, the, the criminal source of income for paramilitaries on both sides of the political fight in Northern Ireland. And removing that border and making it so that goods could flow freely across removed a primary funding source for both Protestant and Catholic paramilitaries. And there's great concern that a return of that border will not just be a political problem in Northern Ireland, but could lead to a military problem as violent par paramilitaries have a new source of income. Although I'm supposed to talk about the American part. You are, yes. Uh, so, uh, although grad school was great there, I really loved it. So, uh, so issues are changing at the American border as well. It's not quite as simple in the United States as uh, increasing or reducing the flow of legal migration because there are different and multiple paths to the United States, including some like immediate relatives that are uncapped and so can't just be turned off and turned on. But there's been a lot of activity making entry to the United States more difficult. Um, there's a couple of different ways to talk about this. One, uh, which we have talked about before as a group, is the Muslim ban or the travel ban that went through a number of iterations. Uh, it was struck down repeatedly by courts before the 3.0 version of the ban was ultimately upheld by the US Supreme Court. There has been a lot of controversy about the way that ban was upheld. So the ban um, reduces to zero lawful immigration from a number of countries that are listed in the travel ban as associated countries. At the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General, arguing on behalf of the administration, said one reason it was okay to have a blanket categorical ban for certain countries was that individual applicants to enter the United States would still receive individual attention. Um, they would not be controlled solely by a categorical decision because there was a waiver process available for people who want to come from some of the listed countries. 
people who practiced immigration law were stunned to hear this mm -hmm. because none of us had heard of a waiver process. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been quite an outcry since then as there are zero people who have been identified as entering the United States through a waiver process and FOIA requests have been unable to, un to, over to uncover any proof of a waiver process. There is no form to fill out. There is no office to send it to. It appears to be a litigation decision that was made and the policy was not followed up on. Um, we have ex personal experience this over at the law school with a potential client who came into the clinic uh, who was, whose spouse was in one of the countries that was on the list and was shocked to discover when the spouse tried to enter the United States, uh, had applied to enter before the ban and then tried to enter after the ban, was told that could, they couldn't enter the United States and given a piece of paper saying that their waiver application had been denied which terrified this family as they thought, oh, of course it was denied. We never even applied for one. We must have sent in the wrong documents. And so the potential client had come to the clinic seeking legal advice for how do I properly apply for this waiver? I want to follow the rules. I want to provide the correct documents. What should I do? Leaving us in the difficult position of explaining that our potential client, non-citizen whose, whose partner was abroad, was demonstrating more commitment to American legal procedures and due process than the Solicitor General was when asserting there was a waiver process that did not and still does not exist. Um, but it's not just traveling in um, through, through processes where you present yourself at the border and you are stuck because of the Muslim ban. Um, there have also, of course, as you know, been terrible changes at, um, at the U.S. southern border physical changes going on. And this is not just talking about the fence or the wall, but through different policies that have been designed to make it less attractive for folks seeking uh, either lawful status or to go through the asylum process at the border to present themselves at the border. Uh, perhaps the most well-known of these is the, uh, the child separation policy that went into effect um, designed to house parents and children separately uh, in order to comply with a series of laws and court decisions about that made it more difficult for the government to hold children uh, traditionally, the government always said, well, if we can't hold the child in detention under American law, we'll just release the family. And they changed that to say, no, we'll release the child, but the parents will stay in detention, even folks who present themselves lawfully at the border seeking asylum. There have been tons of lawsuits about this, two very prominent ones in Southern California. Um, the most recent thing that you may have heard is that the, as an example of policies chasing politics um, and trying to live up to political imperatives rather than policies reacting to facts on the ground, uh, there was concern that the child separation policy was trying to follow on the political imperative that was perceived in the presidential election of doing something tough about immigration. There was not long-term planning for a child separation policy, most egregiously shown recently in a court filing where the US government, when ordered to reunify children with their parents, said, we don't know where the parents are, and it would be unreasonable for the courts to order the federal government to identify where the parents are and where the children are and link them together. It would be unreasonable to even collect that data because it would be too hard and the government's quite busy. Um, the government is indeed quite busy, but part of the reason it was difficult was there was no plan in place at the outset to keep identifiers to tie children to parents. Once folks were split up, they were split up. And the, the entire child reunification fiasco since then has been the result of a policy going into a place with no planning for it whatsoever beforehand. Um, there are also other issues going on at the border. Uh, a new policy in place, um, sort of ironically called the Migrant Protection Protocols, um, protecting migrants to the United States by requiring asylum seekers to remain in Mexico while their asylum cases go forward in the United States, despite American statutory law and international law requiring the United States to process those internally. Um, there have been threats to take asylum seekers in the United States living in border areas and physically return them to Mexico for the duration of their asylum process. There is no legal support for this approach, but that hasn't stopped um, the federal government from saying that they were going to propose it. Uh, and at the same time this has been going on, there has been an increase in harassment of American immigration lawyers seeking to cross the border into Mexico to meet with clients who under MPP are being held or returned to Mexico. Um, a legal organization called Al Otro Lado, which sort of specializes in the incredibly difficult work of representing people physically in Mexico in American immigration proceedings, um, has had lawyers stopped at the border and told, stopped at the Mexican side of the border and be denied reentry into the United States. U.S. citizens. 
F friends of ours were added to the visa watch list usually used for terrorists, friends of ours who are immigration attorneys, and the Mexican government detained them at the border and wouldn't allow them to enter Mexico to meet their clients because the United States had flagged them as persons of interest yeah. who could not be permitted to travel. Now, we, we do love being considered interesting, <laughs> but this is not the, the upshot we had hoped for. Another example of how this was a policy that was chasing a political imperative as opposed to issues on the ground and not much advanced planning, the immigration court in San Diego has no idea how individuals held under the MPP program on the Mexican side of the border will have their cases processed. There have been press releases saying uh, people held under MPP in Mexico will have their cases prioritized. So those cases will go first in San Diego. But immigration lawyers in the San Diego Immigration Court, when they call the court, are told none of those cases are scheduled and the court is booked for the next four to five years. Um, so it's perhaps cases that are currently scheduled will be bumped, but there's, there is no planning in place as of yet. Those individual cases have not been scheduled. Um, this, this might be an okay way, since many of the people arriving at the southern border are seeking asylum, um, this might be a good place to segue from border crossers generally to specific changes in refugees and asylum seekers. Um, the, the easiest way to talk about this in the United States has been the crash in the refugee cap, the number of refugees uh, it's okay to go well, I think this. it's worth just um, reminding folks who might not know the difference between a refugee oh, and sure. an asylum seeker. So refugees are people outside of their country of origin who've been processed usually by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and have been found to have experienced past persecution and or have a credible fear of future persecution on account of their race, religion, mm -hmm. nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. They've been issued a refugee document, they've been found eligible for resettlement, yeah. and countries around the world, like the United States, have said they will welcome them yeah, no, that's and, and resettle them. Asylum seekers are people who have experienced that same kind of persecution, who would meet this definition under international law of a refugee, but have yet to be interviewed and processed and, and allowed to resettle somewhere. And so these individuals make dangerous treks from war-torn, drought-ridden, dangerous parts of the world to a safe other country and say, upon arrival, I'm seeking asylum. So they're, they're the two categories. And here in the US, the US has an annual cap, which according to the Refugee Act of 19, 1980, which amended our Immigration and Nationality Act, the president sets the cap each year for how many people who have been processed by the UN who are recognized as refugees can, can enter. There is no similar cap for people seeking asylum. Um, asylees, People seeking asylum, asylum seekers, arrive at the border, seek asylum, and are, are adjudicated by US-based adjudicators who decide whether they do meet the statutory definition of refugees and should be granted asylum or don't and shouldn't be granted asylum. Right. And it's, this is important for two reasons. One is when people talk about refugees as a legal term, those are people who have already gone through legal process and there is no question they are entitled to relief. There's no doubt as to is a refugee really a refugee. Asylum seekers are going through the process, but there is no power under international or domestic law that allows the United States to say, we're only going to process so many asylees per year. Under both domestic law and international law, if someone presents to the United States and says, I seek asylum, they get asylum proceedings. It's not safe, it's not legal for us to send someone back to a country where they might be tortured or killed without at least reviewing their eligibility for asylum when it's sought. And this is a shared responsibility that right. all countries in the global north have. Both the U.S. and the U.K. are signatories to the 1950 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol. And under that protocol, countries like the U.S. and the U.K. say, when people come seeking asylum, we will not send them back to somewhere where they will be persecuted. However, they enter our country, whether they cross the border with inspection, whether they present themselves at the border, whether they show up later, we have to consider whether they'll face persecution. And we cannot send them back where, where they've come from. We can't, we, this is called the principle of non-refoulement. We will not send a person back to somewhere where they will face this harm. So a couple of things to mention about this. With regard to refugees, people who have already been adjudicated as entitled to protection, the United States has a cap of how many of those refugees who are scattered around the world the United States will admit versus other countries in the world will admit, will, will admit and the president can pick where that cap goes. Um, before President Trump took office, our annual refugee cap was at, oh, my numbers are too small, my, uh, the refugee cap was at 110,000 per year. Now that's the number of refugees admitted. Not that many can actually come in. There's a long administrative process, and if you don't get through the process in time, you don't get to come into the United States, you have to reapply the next year. When the cap 
when Trump entered office and the cap was at 100, 110,000 per year, in the first year of his presidency, 53,700 people actually entered. The president can unilaterally lower the cap, and he did the next year. In 2018, it went from 110,000 to 45,000. Um, 23,400 people actually entered that year. This year, the cap has been lowered to 30,000. It's the lowest number since 1980. Um, there is every reason to think with administrative backlogs higher this year than last year that there will be far, far fewer than 30,000 people who actually enter um, under that cap of 30. But, uh, so the cap for refugees who there is no legal doubt, they are entitled to protection, that cap has shrunk quite swiftly. Asylees, people who have come to the United States and are seeking protection here, are also facing a more difficult road now than they had in the past. Um, so there was a, uh, a case that went through the immigration adjudication system with the ultimate head of the immigration adjudication system. There's a series of judges, but the highest court is the attorney general who has the power individually to pluck a case from the United States Board of Immigration Appeal and rewrite it. And there was a case called Matter of AB, which attorney, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions took and redefined eligibility for asylum, defining out people who were victims of domestic violence and people who were victims of violence by private gangs as opposed to um, state violence, government enforced gangs, even in countries where the central government was so weak that the gangs were effectively running parts of the country. Um, this ruled out many, many, in, in fact, in some from folks coming from Central America, the majority of claims where the reason people are fleeing, the claims tended to be based on domestic violence and gang violence. So matter of AB basically reversed about 20 years of common law growing and building protections for victims of domestic violence and gang violence. That was reversed under Jeff Sessions. There will be litigation about AB going forward in front of the circuit courts, but until AB is reversed, it stands as law, which means not only are immigration courts here in the United States denying asylum to folks who a few years ago would have received it, but uh, non-lawyers at the border who are interviewing people as they arrive at the border seeking asylum now have a paper in front of them that says if this person is claiming asylum based on domestic violence or gang violence, they're not eligible, turn them around at the border, and they don't even come into the United States for um, further processing in front of lawyers and judges. So matter of AB is a big change. Um, the presidential administration has also proposed new asylum rules asserting that if someone crosses the United States unlawfully, so not at a point of entry showing up at a border, but crossing the border, um, what we call EWI, entry without inspection, that they will be ineligible for asylum. Now, this is expressly contrary to, well, I mean, you, you can talk about the asylum Well, if this you want is to. expressly contrary to the treaty I mentioned earlier, the U UN Convention on Refugees. It's also espre expressly contrary to the terms of our own Immigration and Nationality Act, which says in Section 208, we will entertain your asylum application irrespective of how you enter the country. And there was a big debate at the time this provision was added to the Refugee Act with then Senator Ted Kennedy explaining how important it was to protect people people who cross the border without inspection and enable them to seek asylum if that was appropriate. So this is something that was discussed at length in Congress at the time the law was created, and there was unanimous agreement that it should be part of the act. Now, there is every reason to think that this policy will be struck down in court. Right. But until it is, it is applied at the border both by lawyers and non-lawyers trying to figure out who to let in, who not, which asylum cases to grant, which to deny. So asylum and, and refugees are hugely salient. And to, to take us back to our picture, obviously, as you can see from the middle picture, anti-refugee animus was one of the driving forces of the, of the Brexit leave vote. Um, and it's quite possible that um, Brexit is going to enable the UK government to reduce the standards it uses for the reception of asylum seekers, their treatment, their recognition in, 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 in UK law. Um, but it's unlikely because many of the current standards in UK law are driven by the UK's own influence on European law. And so um, it, despite the fact that anti-immigrant, anti anti-refugee, anti-asylee sentiment drove Brexit, it's quite possible that after Brexit, the UK has to do more for asylum seekers, mm. not less. Because when the UK leaves the EU, it is no longer some, subject to something called the Dublin Regulation. And the Dublin, Dublin Regulation is an agreement among countries in the EU that the nation where a non-European immigrant first steps foot, the first foot rule, whichever European country they first arrive in, is the country where their asylum claims should be adjudicated. 
That's the Dublin Agreement. And this is why countries like Greece are so concerned about being the initial reception country for arriving migrants from outside the EU, because it means they are then responsible for their, their care and feeding and welfare going forward. Once the UK is no longer a member of the EU, it cannot invoke Dublin to ship out people every year. Each year, the UK sends at least 600 asylum seekers back to a different European country where they first arrived. And as soon as the UK leaves the EU, those other countries no longer have to honour the UK's request to do that. So it remains to be seen what Brexit will do for asylum seekers within the UK. Uh, the last category of stuff we'd like to talk about hits close to home in Iowa City, doesn't necessarily get as much international or national coverage, but matters in places like this, which is the effect all of this is having on international students um, in higher education. Both of us do admissions work at the law school, and so with those hats on, we have certainly seen a change uh, to, to the volume of applications we're receiving from international students yeah. and the attitude of our international students to studying in the U.S. and how they feel about being here in Iowa. Our, our associate dean actually would like us to be doing more admissions work, but we told her we had a very important speech we had to prepare for. Um, so thank you for that. That was great. <laughs> um, so uh, raise your hand if you have heard of the University of Farmington. Yes, okay. And their big rival, the University of Northern New Jersey. Raise your hand if you know about Northern New Jersey. Yes, a uh, big rivalry. But it, it makes sense that very few hands would go up because neither of these schools exist. Um, <laughs> University of Farmington and University of Northern New Jersey were sting operations created by uh, federal immigration authorities to try and lure in uh, people who were, the, with UNNJ, the focus was particularly on visa brokers. Um, people who would tell international students, hey, I can get you into the United States. You sign up for this school. Don't worry. You don't have to go to any classes. You pay tuition, and then you're able to um, work and do internships. And uh, with UNNJ, there were thousands of international students who it's not clear if they knew it was legitimate or not, but who, in a sting operation designed to collect visa brokers, captured, oh, maybe you know, 20 or 30 visa brokers, but thousands of students who had come to the United States, possibly in good faith, were then told, no, you've, you've broken immigration laws, you have to leave. It, this was a sting operation, your university doesn't exist. Um, with, that was UNNJ, I think it was about three years ago. University of Farmington just broke a couple of weeks ago. And with the University of Farmington, they dropped, the government dropped the pretense of looking for visa brokers. With the University of Farmington, the explicit goal of the sting operation was to find aspiring international students, bring them to the United States, and then arrest them, charge them, and remove them. And make them ineligible ever to return to the United States, because once you've been removed at the conclusion of a removal proceeding, you are barred from re-entering the United States for set periods of time. Now, folks in this room may not have heard of the University of Farmington, but aspiring international students certainly have. Uh, and so the chilling effect that actions like this may have on aspiring international students I mean, it's hard to draw the direct line, but it's, uh, this is not the sort of thing that universities like Iowa that are looking for international students to come take our classes and communities like Iowa City that depend on a, like a large and diverse student body. Um, this doesn't help in places like this, whatever one's attitudes are about whether that sort of sting idea is good or not. Um, so there are things like University of Farmington and University of Northern New Jersey. Uh, the Trump administration has proposed new limits on F-1 visas, on some, some forms of student visas, which traditionally can be easily extended for the duration of your studies. And now they are talking about introducing, um, a, making it more difficult to renew your student visa with expiration dates on those visas occurring in the middle of courses of study. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have two years, even if degree programs are four years or six years or anything like that. Uh, it's unclear whether that will go through but that would have a huge, huge impact on international students. Um, they're also talking about reforms to H-1B visas and something called OPT, Optional Practical Training, which is a way of extending your student visa after you graduate if your first work after you graduate is a quasi-educational experience that is expected or consistent with your training. In, in the legal world, something like doing a judicial clerkship, um, which is not law school, you're working, but it's still like training. Uh, is, you know, OPT is applied across the board and is often used as a way for people to do lawful employment while they wait for their H-1B visas to kick in so they can work. The idea is to cut OPT so that no one would have OPT. OPT would be so short that your OPT would finish before the first wave of H-1B visa winners is announced. 
So everyone, even people who will ultimately win an employment-based immigration lottery to stay in the United States, will have to leave or will be in violation of their status, making it basically impossible to go from being a student to having work authorization long-term in the United States without leaving to go to your home country first. Um, which would be a huge change in the way current policy works. And in the UK, there's a similar chilling effect, obviously, um, because each of the changes that Brahm has talked about, with the exception of um, of the University of Farmington, University of Northern New Jersey, um, every single one of those changes is just proposed. It has yet to go in, into effect. But even just proposing the law and the rumors being out there and coverage being out there in the press is chilling the number of international students applying to come and study in the United States. Mm -hmm. Something very similar is happening in the UK, where European students are being told that as of the date of Brexit, they will no longer be treated like home students. That means they'll have to pay higher tuition. That means that their access will be limited. Um, it means that, um, conversely, of course, British students will no longer be treated as home students elsewhere in Europe, and it will decrease the number of our students who are studying abroad and gaining those inter important international connections. The British government has said that as part of its goal of reducing net migration to under 100,000, they will include student visas in that number. So um, universities are expecting and planning for a downturn in students, and they're worried about the long-term effects on the quality of teaching and the quality of research, because professors, researchers, and other faculty will no longer be able to obtain their visas and come to the UK or may be forced to leave to the leave the UK rather than deciding to stay. And again, there has not been a change to the law, but the patterns of withdrawal from courses of study and the downturn in student visa applications is incredibly marked. So that is the big picture of what's going on in both places. And as lawyers and law professors, we spend a lot of our time discussing the legal ramifications of these policy moves. So in the UK context, we're debating whether the UK's approach to withdrawal from the EU comports with Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty and what the likelihood is that the UK will derogate from the Dublin regulations uh, to do with treatment of asylum seekers. In the US context, we're talking about what federal courts are empowered to do. Can they enjoin this new interim rule on the adjudication of asylum? applications or will the new public charge doctrine violate substantive due process but we wanted to step back a little from the legal theory to leave you um, at the end of our talk with just two concrete examples of the ways in which these post-truth policy imperatives whipped up by post-truth political campaigning are affecting ordinary people's lives in the US and the UK so uh, over the clinic at the law school we have a client um, who is seeking asylum. It's a very long process. And one thing you are entitled to as an asylum applicant is if after you have applied, there's a long period of waiting. And if you don't get a decision on your asylum case within about half a year, you are then entitled to work authorization so you can work lawfully while you wait for your asylum case to be adjudicated. But you do have to wait that half year first. Um, when that half year starts ticking, when the clock starts ticking on that half year, can change based on various circumstances. So when you apply, that's when the clock starts ticking. Half a year goes by, you can start working. But if while the clock is ticking, something happens in your case, say anything you do to delay your case stops the clock. So we have a client who moved here to be with family from Miami. He was in Miami, filed for asylum in Miami, and then moved to Iowa. He didn't know that by moving from Miami to Iowa, and moving the jurisdiction of his case from the Miami court to our closest immigration court, which is in Omaha, moving from the Miami court to the Omaha court, because it was his decision and not the government's decision, that stopped his asylum clock, making it impossible for him to get work authorization until the clock starts again. And we told him, don't worry, because I mean, that's, that's a bummer, but we will get you a hearing as soon as we possibly can. It doesn't have to be your full asylum hearing. It's like a three minute long scheduling hearing when the judge tells you, here's when your asylum hearing will be. Once you get that hearing, that will start your clock again. Our client's hearing was scheduled for this past January, just a couple weeks ago. It snowed out. Uh, we called the court to say, when is his next hearing? And it took the court about a week to figure out the next date. And he's been scheduled for a new hearing in January 2020. Now, there's a couple of things to say about this. One is his was snowed out, but his was snowed out only a few days after we had the government shutdown over December and January. During the government shutdown, about 80,000 cases that were supposed to have hearings, those hearings did not go forward because of the shutdown. So take what's happened to our client Multiply it by 80,000. Um, that's what's happening nationwide. 
But there is something crazier than that. Just two days ago, I got an email. Uh, I got an email from uh, the, the immigration lawyers ombudsperson in Omaha, letting all immigration lawyers in Iowa and Nebraska know about uh, scheduling policies at the Omaha court. Omaha has only three immigration judges. One of them is retiring. Lots of us have been told that we have hearings set up in the future with uh, visiting judge one or visiting judge two. Here is what the email told us. Number one, anybody who has a hearing scheduled with visiting judge one or visiting judge two should know those hearings are fictitious. They will not go forward. Visiting judge one and visiting judge two were put into the system in the hope that we would have someone to visit. We don't have someone to visit. While those numbers were in there, it kept Omaha's technical backlog lower because hearings were scheduled, but you should know if you have a case scheduled with a visiting judge, it will not go forward, and on the date of your hearing, it will be rescheduled to a new judge in the future. One of the judges who is retiring has hearings scheduled out beyond his retirement date. If you have a hearing scheduled with that judge, it will not go forward. It will not be rescheduled until the date of your hearing, even if the hearings are scheduled months beyond that judge's retirement. Third, uh, Without going into the complicated issues of a case called Matter of Pereira, there has been lots of confusion about when immigration hearings were scheduled because the immigration enforcement system, the sort of police officers who arrest and detain people, was not communicating with the immigration court system. And so the documents being given to immigrants saying, you have a court date on this date, uh, were not matching up with dates in the court system. For a long time, the way that was handled was the, the equivalent of police officers would issue forms that said, your court date is to be determined, which was factually accurate. Unfortunately, there's a case that says it's not legally sufficient because the document that starts a case is supposed to say when and where you're supposed to appear. And so the courts held that any to be determined charging document didn't count as a charging document and didn't start the clock and couldn't get people removed. It's very complicated. So to handle that case, what the enforcement side of immigration did was start putting in fictitious dates. That made those documents legally sufficient because now it does say a date and time. But they were not telling the courts that people had hearings on those dates. So there was a scandal when something like 10,000 people across the country were told they had hearings on October 15th, 2018. Another 20,000 were told they had hearings on January 15th, 2019. They would show up at immigration court and the court would say, what are you doing here? Um, okay, so there are Many, many cases in the Omaha court, basically the, the overwhelming majority of non-detained cases, which is the large, like the bulk of cases in Omaha, most of the dates in the system are fictitious. This is what post-truth policy looks like. And our client, who is waiting for his work authorization, his hearing in January 2020 is scheduled with visiting Judge Two. Uh, so we are doing what we can to find out if there is a way to advance his hearing before then. But our client is very unusual in that he has free lawyers who are able to work day and night. My students work all the time to figure out what to do. But most of the folks in his posture won't know that these dates are fake until they show up in court a year from now. And in the duration, they're not able to get work. They're not able to follow through on the rights they would otherwise be ent entitled to, but for these bureaucratic problems in the court system. So we are very short of time, but I do want to tell you my anecdote from the other side of the Atlantic. So I am the only member of my family to graduate from high school and go to four-year college. And so my siblings are working in what are technically unskilled jobs. My sister is an endoscopy technician at the hospital in the small town that I grew up in. She's a member of a 10-person team that assists the nurses uh, and doctors during endoscopy procedures. So she and her she and her co-workers clean the equipment, clean the room, um, and, and assist in these, these very basic ways. She's been doing this for as long as I've been a law professor, so about 10 years now. Um, her team, as is typical in unskilled jobs in the US, consists of 10 people, two of whom, Tessa, my sister, and her friend Beth, are British citizens, eight of whom are European nationals. Um, the NHS is the UK's single largest employer. In a country of about 60 million people, around 3 million people work for the NHS. Um, and amongst the unskilled jobs, you know, nurses' aides and physicians' um, physicians' aides and porters and technicians, the percentage is much, much higher. Um, if Brexit goes ahead next month, all eight of Tessa's non-British colleagues are resigning and returning home to their countries of origin. 
Some of them don't qualify to stay because they haven't been in the UK for five years. Some of them are just so worried about the about the uh, need to show income and go through these checks. None of them makes thirty thousand pounds a year. All of them work with the most vulnerable people in their communities, the elderly people, the children, the people with chronic health conditions. Um, and all eight of them say they don't see the point in staying somewhere where they are made to feel so unvalued and so unwelcome. Um, we have to unfortunately conclude our program, and I really want to give a very big thanks to Brahm Elias and Stella Elias. I also want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Program, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special sponsors, Heidi Gaylor, Karen and Wallace Chapel, and, and uh, excuse me, David and Diane Martin. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. And Brahm and Stella... As a small token of our appreciation, we are happy to once again present you with our very coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.